we should be very concerned. Imprisonment of up to seven years, fines of up to $2.2 million. <sighs> there is a very concerning pattern emerging in research. One in 10 middle and high school kids are doing it. It increases symptoms of depression and anxiety. It can send you to hospital and it is highly addictive. A few weeks ago, the Australian government introduced a new legislation banning it. You just have to look at the products. They're brightly coloured, they're bubblegum flavoured. They're often disguised as highlighter pens or USBs for kids to be able to hide in their pencil cases. For people seeking to supply and sell these products in a recreational market, particularly targeted to kids, there will be very, very significant offences. Even Andrew Huberman is worried. We should be very concerned. Yep. I am talking about vaping. But are the bad news about vaping all just smoke and mirrors? In this video, we will get deep into the science of it and we'll see that there's no smoke without fire. Okay, okay, I'll leave the smoke puns be and stick to science. Let's go. First things first, to satisfy the science stickler in me, Waves should actually be called aerosolers. <sighs> there, I said it. But that doesn't roll so nicely off the tongue, I guess. Anyhow, what are waves? Waves are battery powered devices that heat up liquid mixtures, turning them into an aerosol that people then inhale. If the liquid in this device would be pure water, the name wave would actually be correct, as it would turn it into vapor liquid in gas form. Usually there are other substances mixed into this liquid though, nicotine, flavors, various other chemicals that will be vaporized too, forming an aerosol. So a gas with lots of other tiny bits of stuff in it, like a deodorant. As I said, they should be called aerosolers. I guess vape just sounds fancier. What do I know? I'm just a scientist. Vapes have been around for quite a long time already. They were initially introduced over a decade ago to help people quit smoking cigarettes, advertised as being the safer alternative. But is this true? Is vaping safe? Or can vaping make you sick? Okay, I guess I can safely assume that we are all on the same page that smoking is bad, right? Good. Here in Australia, it is the leading preventable cause of death with as much as 13% of them, often in form of lung, mouth, throat or bladder cancer, emphysema, heart attack or stroke. Smokers lose about 10 years of their life compared to non-smokers. The main active ingredient, nicotine, often takes the blame, but it's not actually the cause of cancer and other diseases. Let's have a closer look at nicotine. Nicotine can be found both in cigarettes and in vapes. It is a stimulant that speeds up signaling between your body and brain, seemingly making you more alert. This is also the reason why it is highly addictive. Your body gets used to that stimulated state after a while of regular exposure and has a really hard time functioning without it. But vaping nicotine is a lot safer than smoking nicotine. According to the UK government, up to 95% safer. So it's all good then. Vaping is better than smoking. You can't get nicotine containing vapes in Australia. Anyway, done and dusted. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Firstly, Recent reports show that even though the vapes you can buy in Australia say they have no nicotine in them, they often contain it anyway. And quite a lot of it too. It's just one of those things that's just not quite regulated and controlled enough. Are you the beer baron? There are also a few recent studies that show that nicotine can actually mess with your brain quite a lot. There is a very concerning pattern emerging in research that shows that people with depression are more likely to be smoking and smokers are more likely to be diagnosed with depression at some stage in their life. Hmm. And the same pattern is now showing up for vapes. There is more depression and people with suicidal thoughts found in vapors. But we know correlation and causation are two different things. So to check if the correlation and causation adds up here, Researchers did a lot of study in mice, which is actually beneficial in this case, as it takes away societal influences that could skewer the tendency to smoke. The issue is that rodents 
don't voluntarily start smoking. They know that smoke is toxic, so they would rather get as far away from it as quickly as possible. Smart choice, if you ask me. But they will vape. To test this, researchers designed a little vape chamber for mice. They are in a little plastic box with a hole that fits their little nose and when they put their nose in it, it triggers vape release into the box. And those mice basically hotbox themselves in vape. Oh boy, do they love it. Now, you don't just get a bunch of mice with a vape addiction from this. Obviously, this was just one experiment to show how receptive they are to trigger the release and how addictive it is in rodents. In a different control study where the researchers exposed the mice to a defined cloud of vape once a day over the course of several days and examined their brains afterwards, they found that their central amygdala, the part of the brain that processes emotions, initially lights up when they got exposed to nicotine, but after the five days of vape hotboxing, it didn't anymore. So the question arises, does this vaping temper with how they process emotions and how does this transfer to humans it's not 100 percent clear as this research is pretty new and so far it's only been done in rodents but other studies show that nicotine also messes with our reward system in the brain specifically we're talking about the neurons in our brain that give off hits of dopamine whenever we experience something nice dopamine the happy chemical you get as a reward Let's say I get a notification on my phone that somebody liked my video. Bing! Dopamine hit, making me feel good. But then I'll go about my day as per usual. Nicotine does pretty much the same thing. As I said before, it's a stimulant that also fires up those dopamine release neurons. So when you first take a vape puff, it might just make you feel good in that moment. But in comparison to my video-like dopamine reward, Smokers and vapors usually keep puffing throughout the day. So instead of getting a single hit and going about your day, their dopamine levels are constantly high to the point where your brain gets overstimulated. And to cope with this constant overstimulation, your brain adapts by becoming less responsive to nicotine so it doesn't trigger so much dopamine release. So the question to ask is now, when your brain doesn't trigger dopamine release from a clear stimulant like nicotine, would it trigger dopamine release from other stimulants in daily life, like smelling flowers, spending time with loved ones, achievements and the like? Researchers suggest not. And that, my friends, is a clear sign of depression. So nicotine is not as innocent as it seems. Deep breaths. One of the main concerns about vapes comes from the fact that we do exactly that, breathing it in. Anything in the air that we breathe ends up in our lungs to filter out the good stuff, oxygen, from all the other crap in the air that we don't want in our body. And speaking of other crap, vaping seems to produce a lot of lung issues. There are a multitude of studies, like this one from a group in Toronto, Canada, that show that people who regularly vape show more respiratory symptoms. They also show a correlation between the amount of puffs of vape they took and the severity of those symptoms. In short, the more puffs they took, the more they reported coughing, coughing up phlegm, shortness of breath and so on. Generally, vapors showed higher level of wheezing than non-vapors. Defenders of the fine vape might now say that those symptoms are not at all that concerning. We can deal with a bit of coughing since 2020. <coughs> in reality though, are those mild symptoms a little bit like the cannery in the coal mine when it comes to the state of your lungs. Those mild symptoms can often lead to chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD in short, and asthma, much like you also see in smokers, which at that stage basically means your lungs are <coughs> screwed. But this isn't from the nicotine. So where does this come from in vapes? The proof is in the pudding flavor. Oh no, not the flavors. Yes, yes, the main culprit seems to be just that. The colorful palette of vape cuisine you can find in any good or even bad sorted vape shop. The ones of you who now think of crushed and neatly distilled pineapples to get the essence for the vape flavor 
is unfortunately mistaken. Very much so, actually. The fruity and herby tastes are produced the same way as any other flavor product in the food industry, by a mix of chemicals. Mmm, tasty cinnamon, cherry almond, banana. Actually, that cinnamaldehyde, benzaldehyde and isomal acetate you're smelling there. And that's totally fine. These artificial flavors that are in a lot of our foods were tested and deemed safe for consumption for us humans, but in our stomach, not necessarily in our lungs. A major example of this going horribly, horribly wrong is the popcorn lung incident. The story starts in a popcorn factory with a chemical called diacetyl. This particular molecule is completely safe to eat and often used to give food buttery flavor. Yep like the delicious butter popcorn. Unfortunately, in the early 2000s, a few factory workers in a popcorn factory inhaled diacetyl in a very high dose and got severe lung damage from that. So much that some even needed a lung transplant. Now this chemical was also in buttery flavored vapes and led to a guy in 2015 getting lung damage from vaping it. Safe to eat, really problematic when inhaled. So. Are all flavors bad? <laughs> well, it's hard to say. There are a lot of them out there and each and every one of them needs to get tested separately. But how do they determine what is safe and what not? Let's look at an example for this and start with a holiday favorite, cinnamon. This research group took different cinnamaldehyde, the chemical for cinnamon flavor, containing e-liquids and put them in a petri dish with human lung cells and they found that the cinnamaldehyde affected their cilia. Those ciliated cells play a major role in our lungs to clear our airways of mucus. So clearing away the cilia with chemicals and vapes could affect our ability to sweep out gunk, phlegm and mucus and the like in our respiratory tract. The same group also looked at the impact of cinnamaldehyde on immune cells. This is a really cool set of experiments. Generally, you can take immune systems out of your body and put them on something like bacteria and you can still see them attacking the bacteria outside of the body in a petri dish. Now, if you throw cinnamaldehyde into this mix, the immune cells showed no attack on the bacteria anymore. A similar thing could be observed for vanilla flavor, by the way, but it's not just the flavors that are bad for your lungs. One big troublemaker in vape liquids is propylene glycol. You might have heard of this one before as it's often found in those fog machines on theater stages or nightclubs. It has previously been shown to cause respiratory issues when we breathe this in. So the fact that it is in liquids that are vaporized for us to inhale is very troubling. The biggest problem with all of this, however, is that we just don't know what exactly is in those liquids and how safe or unsafe it really is for us humans. It's basically the opposite of a drug trial. For the tightly regulated drug industry, everything that will get administered to humans is extensively tested. First in petri dish, then in mice, than humans before it can get onto the market. These flavors are already directly in humans without any studies or trials on them. And researchers are now desperately trying to backtrack what they could be doing to us. <sighs> that was a lot. Where does this leave us now? What is the solution to the vape phenomenon we currently see? I guess banning anything completely never helped anybody. Although Australia is trying it anyway. You're out there somewhere, beer baron, and I'll find you. No, you won't. Yes, I will. I guess at the very least we should try and very tightly regulate and control what chemicals are actually in those waves and really make sure they are nicotine free when they say they are. What are your thoughts and have you resisted the vape temptation so far? Let me know in the comments. I'll see you in my next video. Until then, as always, stay sciencey.